What's going on, everybody, and welcome to another Coffee Break episode. Today is we're gonna have a fun one. We have with us uh, Steve Orozco, entrepreneur, business owner, and now going into politics and tapping into uh, uh, in that field of New Haven, correct? Yes, sir. Um, and he's actually gonna be going up for Senate, and I'm pretty excited about it. I've been following him for a little time now, and and um, uh, I like what he's doing. And we want to talk a little, we want to dive a little bit deeper as to like, who is Steve? What has he been about? And um, what kind of like led him to go into to the politics? So dude, it was a pleasure meeting you, bro. Absolutely. And it was a, a good time to actually, this is going to be like probably the third time that we probably uh, got in touch with one another and stuff Absolutely. like that. But when I saw you, it was just kind of organic yeah. when, when we met. But thank you for the opportunity for, for being here and, and um, I want to get to know a little bit more about you too. I see, you know, your reels and your Instagrams and stuff. So first things first, right? You, you're, you're an entrepreneur, you're a business owner, you're super into health and, and fitness and stuff. Like what made you get into that stuff? Man, you already know. So the first where we met was at, in the at wrestling Tugman. room at Tugman Wrestling. Shout out to Tugman Wrestling. Yeah, best wrestling program in the state. <laughs> Shout out to Blair. Um, I always say wrestling built me. I think wrestlers are just built different, mm. you know, because one of the sports where you really are accountable for everything. You don't have a team. It's just you on the mat. Right. You have to accept failure. So come onto the mat the next day and try to win. Right. Uh, you start cutting weight at an early age. That, so the mental fortitude that you build and the commitment is second to, is second to none. There's no other sport like it. Um, and it just, it just turns, you know, boys into men. Right. And they say, there's, there's a quote that says, uh, um, like, you learn a lot in wrestling, and the last thing you learn is how to wrestle because huh. of all the intangibles that go with it. Um, and, you know, that's why my son's on the wrestling mat. He started wrestling when he was four, yeah. and then COVID happens. Okay. And then, obviously, wrestling was shut down for, like, two years. You know, Tugman was shut down. So, you know, once he was, like, I think he was six or about six years old, and I didn't force wrestling. I'm like, man, you know, I'm just going to wait till he asked to come back. Okay. So he didn't ask until about eight years old. He ate me up all the time. Like, well, we got to get back on the mat. But I know the dedication it takes, especially at a place like Blair, because these kids are wrestling all year round. And usually most kids are just wrestling in the winter. Like it's the winter sport like basketball mm -hmm. or baseball in the spring or soccer in the fall. Right. So the kids who wrestle all year round have such an advantage because the kids only wrestle during the winter as a winter sport yeah. will never catch up to the, those other kids okay so yeah that's cool then so then now you 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 got heavily involved in it and you end up opening up you're, you're a new haven native correct uh i'm actually from uh, rhode island rhode so island. rhode island native so i mean i've been all over the place okay. i went from rhode island to, to new york city for undergrad i went to pace university this was 2000 um and then I ended up coming to Connecticut. I went to grad school in Connecticut. I went to Albertus Magnus, got my MBA and my MS. Wow. Um, at the time, I was training in MMA. Yeah. Um, I fell in love with jiu-jitsu, bro. Like, I really yeah. took that Kool-Aid to the effect that I quit the finance industry and then moved to California. I turned pro as an MMA fighter. Wow. So I was able to still stay um, in combat sports. So did, did, did you travel a lot in the MMA? Like, did, did you end up... Like, yeah, so like my last fight, I mean, my last fight was in Melbourne, Australia. So I was 8-0 at the time. And I got the opportunity to fight the number one kid in Australia. Um, the hometown hero, he was like 16-4, and four, beast of a, of a, a fighter. Mm. And uh, I just I took my first L. And it still eats me up every day. Like, what could I have done different? Because I was... I was mentally prepared. I trained so hard. Right. Um, I think I, oh, I cut too much weight. I cut like 20 pounds in three days. Okay. Uh, fighting at 2 a.m. was a little different. Fighting in a ring was different. Yeah. Being the main event in the crowd. You know, you, with, you ever understand, people don't understand the whole hometown, I'm saying home field advantage. Right. Like, why does it matter? It right. doesn't matter when you're on the field in football. Yeah. Why does the hometown team usually win or have the advantage? And you realize it once you're like in the hornet's nest. Yeah. And, I, and I felt it. I mean, it was so crazy walking into the ring and being the main event. The crowd was so loud. I'm literally the ring, because it was canvas, was like shook under my feet. It was insane. And I, and I just watched him walk out to the ring and, and I'm looking at him in the corner and I just, 
I don't want to say I froze, but I gave him too much respect when I got in the ring. Okay. So, you know, the fight started. I think I threw three leg kicks. I remember kick, bang, kick, bang, kick, bang. And then we both threw a punch at the same time to have this picture in my phone that I always look at where I threw a left hook and he threw a right hand and it shows me just miss and him connect because my head is like this. Yeah. And after that, I don't remember anything. It was like survival, survival mode. Yeah. Um, I didn't drop. I'm sorry, I didn't get knocked out. Yeah. But man, I just, he hit me and all I remember was I backed up against the ropes. He threw an uppercut. When you have your boxing gloves on, yeah. you can cover. But we had that MMA gloves, split the gloves, yeah. hit me and I dropped. And I still say the story all the time. It's so vivid still. I was on all fours. My nose is pouring blood. My, my uh, coach is yelling at me. The ref is behind me saying, improve your position. And he is just behind me throwing punches. Um, and just sounds like gunshots going off in the back of my head, you know, because you don't realize adrenaline is such a powerful drug, let's just say. Yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. feel the pain, but you yeah. hear the crack, 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 and the rattle, rattle. And all I had to do was turn over onto my back and pull guard and get my composure back. Right. But like those three or four seconds felt like eternity. Yeah. And before you know it, ding, 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 the fight was over. And I was like, ah. Oh, was, 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 was that your turning? You felt like that was your turning point? Like, okay, yeah. no, I'm not sure if this is for me. And you... Yeah, because I was... I was uh, 33 at the time. My son was only one. My body had already been so beat up from all the years of fighting and being in fight camp. Yeah. I just felt like it was kind of over. You know, I'm, I'm a realist. I'm like, I'm not keep on fighting until I'm 38 and, yeah. and just take such a big hit. So I, but I remember, you know, some guys after they fight, some guys go out and party, right. some guys reflect. Everyone has their thing. Yeah. Um, for me, there was four of us, no, three of us Americans that all went over there. And I remember the other two, they also lost. And they were good fighters too. Um, they all went out and partied with, the, with my coach and trainer. Yeah. And I stayed home by myself. I'm sitting in the room and it's like dark out. And I was, my anxiety was through the roof. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. Remember that movie, uh, Friday? Yeah, Chris yeah. Rock. Yep. There's that scene where Chris Rock, I think he does like the angel dust and he's in the pigeon coop. Oh, he's like, he's like, uh, that was me in the room. I was like, a feeling I never really felt before. Yeah. And I just kept on thinking to myself, what am I going to do next? You know, I knew my family was watched, probably watched the fight. Mm -hmm. It's like 4 a.m. by the time they watch it. And I said to myself, what can I do to stay in the sport that I love so much? And it was, you know, open up my own gym, where I can have my own fight league, I mean fight team, or start my own fight league, be my own Dana White. Mm. Um, and when I got my MBA, the program was a, a consultancy type of paradigm where they want you to have the ability to go into a company, find the bottlenecks and make it more efficient. So I, I felt, hey, what can I do in the sport to make it better? And at the time, the one thing about MMA that what it was lacking was like that prestige where it was a very NASCAR sport, mm. you know, bud lights and tap out t-shirts, bleed, yeah. bleed, bleed. Whereas boxing wasn't like that. Right. People would go to major boxing fights in fur coats and gowns. It was like a thing. Yeah. And it's like formula one. And Big difference. Premium, oh, that, yeah. That premium. premium. Big difference between formula one and NASCAR, both auto car right. racing, but two different crowds. Right. Like, I want the Formula 1 crowd, I want the boxing crowd to come watch MMA live, not just at home on TV. Right. So I started a company called Smash Global. I got fully licensed by the California State Athletic Commission, so a full pro fight league. Um, I've had 10 shows so far. COVID obviously slowed us down. We're going to have our first show in Bridgeport next year at the Amphitheater. Whoa. So I locked that in. And uh, we just do it different. I do, at least in Los Angeles where we have it, I do 25 tables of 10. But just like a wedding, yeah. but instead of a dance floor in the middle, there's a cage. So you're eating your steak and your yeah. salmon, you're and you're watching the fights, have the full red carpet. Um, we do the open bar, black tie and gown. I honor someone who's made an impact in combat sports or movies. Yeah. So you can have honored Freddie Roach, Chuck Liddell, Steven Seagal, wow, Tito I Ortiz. I didn't, I didn't even know it was like to that extent. Yeah, That's... Mel Gibson. Really? Yeah, I've had literally all the A-listers have come and it just it was such like an amazing proof of concept yep. 
And right when I was like really getting it, COVID happened and it just shut everything down in 2020. And California was the last place where you could have events. Mm -hmm. And then when they started allowing events again, it was, you know, the, the, the distancing and all this other stuff, it was like impossible all because- little policies that they needed to- Yeah, it, it was it's such a barrier because you could, if you had it in a, an arena, you could sit people like four seats away from each other kind of thing. Right. But for us, it was, the point of it was to network. You're sitting at a table of 10, you're meeting all other people who spent $500 on a ticket mm -hmm. compared to like your 25 normal. And so that whole the mindset of, man, if you get 300 people to spend $500, let's just say, yeah. and sell $10,000 tables, that's like a room that you want to be in, yeah. a networking room. Yeah, right. So if you can't get your ROI in that $500 with the people you're going to meet that night, yep. then you didn't do your job. Correct. You know, yeah. and it's a world of network. No, I, I like that. I, I love that concept. And that's why I like doing these coffee break, uh, the, these interviews. Yeah. Because I love hearing people's story, how they started something, like what avenue they were able to, to get into. You yep. know what I mean? Um, You took, you know, MMA and fighting to a whole nother level. You didn't, you, you took that L in Australia, but, but it still didn't like drive you away from yep. the overall passion that you had for just fighting martial arts and all that stuff, yep. which, which is good. Um, I guess that's that entrepreneurial, you know, drive that, that we have. Yes. So, so from an entrepreneur to an entrepreneur, right? What, what keeps that drive going? Like what keeps you going? That even though like when you were going into this fighting uh, uh, scene or, or you had that passion for it, did, did you ever see yourself like, you know, moving into the, like being an entrepreneur or did you see yourself as a, as just a fighter and yeah. then you had a turning point in your life and it's like, okay, I'm going to revert to this. Like, was that always something in, in your, in your kind of like in your direction? I think when you, so before I actually got my MBA and I was in finance, like I worked at a place called Barnum Finance Group right here in Shelton. So I was in the finance world. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes, you know, you get into corporate America that's when you really understand who you are. Can I do this? Can I do like this Groundhog Day lifestyle where I go to work for the same company from nine to six o'clock and punch in, punch out? Not everyone's built like that. Right. I was great for a first, um, maybe it was a year, two years, I think two years I was there. Yeah. And after that, I was like, man, I can't do this. I hated going to work. So I'm just the kind of person, I know this is so cliche to say, people say this all the time, but I'm literally driven by passion. Yeah. If I don't love what I do, I just don't want to do it. I'd rather not. Yeah. Anybody can do anything for a year. I could go work for Uber for a year. Mm -hmm. I could work for Starbucks for a year. Anything yeah. new is fun. Right. But it's like it's that past that honeymoon, yeah. are you still cool with it? Yeah. So I think being an entrepreneur and being able to do what you love is important. Yeah. But most people never get to do it because it's so hard to make money on your passion. Mm -hmm. And it takes time. Yeah. You know, especially in the beginning, like if you're going to be a videographer, yep. you might be negative for like five years, yep, yep. but then eventually something clicks and something happens and all of a sudden now you're in the green. Yeah. You got to be willing to um, go through that, that fight. Yeah, yeah. I, I was in tech finance for almost 19 years, right? Yep. So in New York City, I was at a bank out there doing technology and I had one guy that, that told me, hey, listen, if, if an investor won't invest in somebody who hasn't invested in themselves yes right? so and i and i think that that's where where the where the call to action is right yeah it's just like okay like you have this thing that you like to do or you're passionate about are you investing in yourself right yeah like are you willing to put dollars in into yourself for uh to to better your craft or yep. or to learn or to be a part of other stuff and and i totally agree and a lot of people want to get like the easy way out of course. And I'm not saying that a nine to five is like the is is like the, the the easy way out, but it's it's more of like. Um, you get that active every two weeks that check, and you're not yeah. thinking about anything. Yeah. But and then you step outside into a different world like entrepreneurship and and just starting your own business. You start seeing like, wait a second, I'm doing nine to five here, and here I feel like I'm working twenty four seven. Yep. But you you have more drive for it right in a sense because you know it's all going for your benefit yeah in a way right yeah so i i like that and sometimes pe people don't people don't get that part you know um, um of just you know pushing through for yourself and once you cross that little hurdle then you start seeing everything connect 
So yeah. for for you, when when you started doing um, the fighting, you you got kind of closed out for COVID. Yeah. Doing these events and stuff like, what was your pivot at that point? So COVID hits now affected yeah. a lot of people. Some for the good, some for the worse. Yep. So what was your 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 pivot to kind of like say, wait a second, like okay, COVID hit now. Am I just gonna stop everything, or am I just gonna yeah. keep going? Like, what was your turn? What was your pivot there? Um, so we lived in Los Angeles up until 2019. God was obviously watching over us because we moved back to Connecticut the summer of 19, the end of the summer of 19. Yeah. Um, so it was before COVID happened. Being in California during COVID is like the worst place in the country. Like they literally shut you down. Like it was, um, you were really locked down. You couldn't go outside. There was curfews, you had a mask outside. It was pretty crazy. All businesses were shut down. Um, but when I came back, COVID, ha- we came back on the pretense of taking Smash Global and bring it to New York City. I had met with numerous venues. We had everything already outlined. And then COVID happens. So like, oh, great. Now what do we do? Thankfully, um, with all the shutdowns, being a business owner, you know, between the unemployment and everything else that they gave you, the benefits, the, what was, what was the loan? What were the things? Uh, P, yeah, for, for, for small business loans? Yeah, it was a P, 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 P loans. P- Those PPP1, PPP2. So, like, between all of that, I was able to, like, really sit back and not stress so much. But during that process, I met up with this dude, Matt Ramos, who owned a gym in Milford. And then we started, we partnered up, which is why I'm in Milford now at, at the gym. And uh, I train pretty much just elite wrestlers and fighters because that's like my passion and really what I love. Again, I need to be in that space to to be satisfied, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it does. And obviously fitness is everything. And then from there, you know, we just start a supplement line, with the fasting product that's going to come out in like the next 30 days. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you just keep grinding and grinding. I, and I love it because also, like I said from entrepreneur to entrepreneur that there's always things that we learn from each other yep and 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 how your drive adds to my drive you know what i mean and just always being innovative i think we yes. always got to innovate ourselves right we're, we're always yeah. got to unlearn to relearn and and always trying to like you know make changes to ourselves in a in a good way absolutely so so that that's so good so now you you end up opening up smash right mm-hmm. and you actually have a location in new yep. haven right yep in new in milford oh in milford that yes. people can stop by and hit yes. up and you have absolutely. memberships there and yep. stuff like that it's more like semi private so i got to do uh, that more like one on one or like maybe groups of four kind of thing yeah um but yeah but i, I love doing it but but the funny part about that is if you said hey steve would you rather train soccer mom for a hundred dollars an hour yeah. or would you rather train the ninth grade wrestler for 50 bucks i'm taking the 50 bucks all day because obviously the short term different story but long term yeah train that person a hundred dollars an hour is like it's like watching paint dry it's not it's not enjoyable for me yeah whereas when i'm training these kids making them better it's like i'm motivated i'm inspired it doesn't take like the wind beneath my sails kind of thing mm. a wind away from my sails yeah um Again, I, I have to enjoy what I do. Yeah. Some people are dip built different. That's great. Yeah. Sometimes I wish, like talked about working nine to five. Yeah. Sometimes I wish I could be that person. Yeah. Just wake up, go to work nine, come home at six. I don't have to worry about anything else. I know how much I'm getting paid. Yeah. I just, it doesn't motivate me enough. Yeah. And after a while, you're like, man, I, you know, you have those days. I hate my job. I hate my life. I hate this. I hate that. You know? Yeah. No, I, I, Man, it's it's always good to to hear somebody like speak almost the same language because sometimes like you can't speak to everybody about stuff like this because yeah. they they won't get it, especially if they're like diehard office fans, yeah. right? Yes. Just sitting in the office and just becoming a star in a cubicle or or with somebody yeah. in the office. You know what I mean? I was never like that either. Like that 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 was never my my thing. You know, until you know you start seeing like wait a second, you almost start you 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 get into a point where it's like you fight with yourself. Yes. Because you're like, am I in the right place or what, yeah. what am I? And then that's when you start discovering, like, wow, I can do this, I can do that. And mm-hmm. you start tapping in, you start entertaining those those other areas of uh, of you yes. that you can do. And you're like, no, wait, you know? And, and it's nothing against the nine to five workers, trust me, no. like, you know, but it's just it's just different, man. We're, we're just built a little bit different and we, we have a different drive and, and um, 
so so th th this is really good i i like where 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 you're heading and what you're doing um and then from opening up this location now that you have in milford i'm pretty sure you have uh, allowed yourself to enter into a community basis right like mm -hmm. just people with the yeah. town yeah. so now was was that also another turning point for you like opening up the 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 location and then now you know entering into the to the politics area like mm -hmm. what what made you get into that now i never thought in a million years i'd get into politics okay. bro because i was never the person who cared about politics you know i'm like hit from history standpoint in voting you know i voted for obama twice not because i knew anything i voted for him because he was black <laughs> and then hillary clinton in 2016 i voted for her because i have a daughter and i'm like oh yeah you know she'll inspire a whole generation of little girls that they can be whatever they want to be Nothing was ever like policy driven because some, most people don't actually care. Yeah. I think half the country cares about the identity or like the relatability, the yeah. social issues. And half the country cares about policy and how it impacts them like financially. Yeah. Um, and now as I've matured, yeah. <laughs> you know, now I actually care about policy. And I look into the people and I'm, yeah, I'm a Republican now, yeah. which I was always a Democrat. Doesn't mean I would never vote Democrat again, right. but the person has to have a conservative mindset for me to do that. Right. Um, but long story short, in 2020, I got a knock on my door um, from a neighbor on my street. He goes, hey, Steve, you know, people really think you make a good alderman. And I'm like, what's an alderman? <laughs> and he goes, you know, you're, you're basically the mayor of your neighborhood. So like in New Haven, there's 30 wards. And there is a representative from every ward, which is an alderman. Yeah. Then all th all of those thirty people vote on legislation for the mayor. Mm. Um, the same way, con same way like Congress for president would yeah. be like alderman for the mayor. And uh, I'm like, okay, sure, why not? Because <laughs> mm. um, they wanted to get this this guy out who was in there for like seven terms and all this other stuff. So I said, sure, let's do it. And I campaigned and I was knocking on doors and giving out flyers and yard signs and I actually enjoyed it because I actually like people yeah um, good people right and uh, I caught a lot of hate for it mm. and I think it really bothered me at first and it really drove me to want to be in politics because when I was a Democrat and I'd be like yeah Obama or yeah this or yeah that no one ever said anything and as soon as I turned Republican the attacks that I got your wife is this, your son is this, die, like all of these most egregious things wow. from Democrats or like liberals. I'm like, this is crazy. I thought you were supposed to be the good side, like the nice side, yeah. the tolerant side, right. but it's a complete opposite. Wow. Um, kind of like the same way, you know, Trump was revered and loved by everyone before 2016. I mean, he was on The View getting hugs yeah. and kisses. I mean, CNN loved him. Every black entertainer loved him, wanted to be pictured with him. Mm -hmm. Then he said, I'm running as a Republican. All of a sudden, it's like the Democratic machine right. and the media all just villainized him. And I'm like, dude, this is crazy. I can't believe this is even happening. Yeah. Um, and that, but that I, feel, I felt it because I felt like that's what happened to me. Gotcha. Obviously, on a very small scale. Yeah. But that drove me to want to even go deeper. Um, the same way I think it drives Trump. I'm like, Trump, why are you running? Yeah. You're, you're rich. You're good. Like, yeah. why are you taking all this heat and stress? Yeah. But I think it's also a personal battle. Like, yeah. you like, you really want, you really do care. You want people to understand that you care. Um, and it, but it's tough. Yeah. It's tough. And I deal with, so in 2022, I, when I ran for Senate, I had a hard time dealing, in, t between 2020 and 2022, it wasn't easy um, mentally all of the, the attacks that I got. I'm like, man, I actually want to make a change. I actually like all of you guys. I'm not trying to fight with Democrats. Uh -huh. I just see New Haven as a failed city. Right. Why aren't we trying to change it? Correct. And then I'm like, wait a minute. So like, like all these major cities, right? Chicago, for example, another failed city. Mm -hmm. So I asked myself, why aren't these people who are from these cities, and they know their city is failing, why aren't they using that same energy and passion on their own officials that are failing them. Why are they attacking the other side mm -hmm. when the other side has never even made a single decision in your city? To me, that doesn't make any sense. Like yeah. New Haven, statistically, we're ranked last in education in the entire state. Mm -hmm. We're first in crime in the state. 
We're first in fentanyl overdoses in the entire state, like second in taxes, almost a 30% poverty rate, haven't had a Republican mayor since 1953. So you're telling me you hate me as a Republican when I've, and Republicans have never even made decisions here? Yeah. Why aren't you using that same energy and passion for change against the people that are actually in office and failing you? Yeah. So that like drives me to at least, even if I can't win, at least I can be the, the not the beacon of hope, but like yeah. the person that's willing to be on the stage and be attacked to press Democrats and let every know, everyone know what they're actually doing wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's good. Because but you, it, it shows where your heart is at, you know? Yeah, but you realize you can't change people. I mean, I, I said this to someone the other day. I got asked to go to an endorsement for the a Yale Union. Now, Yale is like the liberal institution of like the country, you know? Um, it was like the local 34, which is like the secretary and technical staff of the union. 80% women, um, obviously, obviously be the very, very liberal part compared to like the hard laborers, right? Wow. So I walk in the room, there's five people on their political committee, and I knew I wasn't going to get the endorsement as a Republican, but I want to have those tough conversations. The same way Trump went to Chicago and got grilled by the NABJ, yep. um, most people aren't willing to go into that fire. Yeah. But if you can put yourself through those uncomfortable situations, get through anything yeah. so I walk in the room and they're drilling me one of the women specifically she was really passionate about being a Democrat really passionate about her community and I appreciate that and we probably would be so cool outside the room but there was one moment where she started getting a little irrational like overly passionate which things she said things that didn't make sense mm -hmm. to the point where I'm like there's no point even saying anything and fighting with you because we're not gonna get anywhere oh, yeah. but she said you, you know which side that if we vote for, they're going to bring back slavery. And I just think to myself, explain to me how that would happen. Like, how could slavery come back to America with the abolition of, of slavery and the Constitution, with the human rights and all the activism we have here? Mm -hmm. I mean, this country isn't racist on a level that they're going to throw people back on a plantation. Yeah, yeah, Do you yeah. know what I mean? So. Sometimes you just, you can't reason with those kinds of people. Don't get me wrong, there's people on the far right can't reason with either. Yeah. Um, but it, those are the kind of things that bother me because I'm the type of person where rational people sit in the center and we go left and right depending on the situation. Like I know plenty of Republicans that are pro-choice. I know plenty of Democrats that are super pro Second Amendment. So there's not like a one box. We shouldn't all be in one box. Yeah. So the fact that we're like divided doesn't make any sense. I just blame the media. Yeah. And like, right, I don't want to say far. I feel like the far right doesn't, doesn't, they kind of like stay in the closet and mind their business. Right. Where the far left right now is really vocal. Right. But don't get me wrong, when Trump was in office, the far right was much more vocal because they felt confident. that confident because now I got our guy on top. So now the far left feels like they have their person on top. And the person on top, they pander and gaslight to that to that base because mm. that's like their marketing machine. Right. They know what to do to rile them up. And um, that's the problem. Yeah. It's like in a, in a den of lions, right? Like you're going yeah. into a den of lions there and you just got to be strong enough to, to withstand, right? Like have that tough skin in, in a way. Obviously, you know, you're, you're going for Senate now. You're not going to please everybody. Right. Uh, it's going to be impossible. But um, as long as you have the, the right heart, the right posture to 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 help the people, you know, in your community and make a change. I, you know, we hear it all the time. You've been we've got people that 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 are in uh, uh, in office for four years when it's time now to to go in for elections again. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do this. Dude, you were you were already there for four years. Exactly. So what makes you think that you're gonna want to do it now? Like like you know, and you get people that get into these positions, and then they start saying, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do that." And it's like, bro, you, you should have done it already. How can change happen if you don't force your politicians to earn it? Right. So if you're if they're like, "Oh my God, well you know, we're always gonna get the vote." Right. So like you're in Chicago. Why would people in Chicago and Philadelphia and New Haven actually fight for you? When they don't have to, they already got your vote. Like for me, I think the I think logically, yo, let's just vote all these people out. We just vote for the other team for once. 
We'll see what they can do. And if they make change, we're going to ride with them. If they don't, we'll get rid of them in two years and put back in our old, old people yeah. who are now actually have to campaign and fight for us this time. Right. But nobody wants to do that because people's egos, I think, get in the way of things. Right. And like you said before about um, politicians, hey, you were in four years and you didn't do anything. What makes you think you're going to now? And that's why I get mad at this whole like, Kamala Harris thing. I'm like, yo, Kamala. You're the vice president right now. Right. All these things you're talking about, do them now. Yeah. What are you talking? Should have been done them. <laughs> you should have been done them for sure. Yeah. But you still have months to like implement these things you're talking about. Yeah. Biden's still the president. He could be out there doing what he's supposed to do, but yeah. none of them are. They're just trying to get our vote. Yeah. Um, and they just pander. And Democrats really have mastered it. They've mastered like the art of manipulation. Uh-huh. Just like gaslighting people based on yeah. identity politics and you yeah. start putting all these people in different boxes yeah. which is also recipe for a disaster because after a long time of doing that what's going to happen is all these different boxes are going to start fighting with each other for their space on the totem pole at the top right. so like no one's ever like the trans community or say the black community like when are you going to ever be satisfied yeah so if you're a trans community you know, what, what do you want like what do you need oh, yeah and, and when we be satisfied to stop fighting for things? Yeah. Or if it's black America, it's, I don't know, at the top of the mountain, it's reparations, right? It's always a conversation to gaslight you with. Okay, so what's the number? Mm-hmm. 500,000? 5 million? Okay, we give everybody 5 million, then what? Yeah. Are you going to come back to us in, in 10 years and ask for more yeah. when you don't use the money properly? Yeah. Or the trans community, what do you want? Do we need a president that's trans? Yeah. You know what I mean? Does does a a gay pride flag need to be on every single sports team all year round. What is it? And I feel like no one's ever satisfied Mm -hmm. when you put them in boxes instead of just treating everybody equal in the first place. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you start- It's true. And and that that, that pressing, right, on the people is is what kind of, eventually is gonna pop. It has to. It's it's gonna, it has to to pop either Mm -hmm. a year from now, two years from now, or whatever. But um, it's just, I, I think at this point, it's about just, making little changes as much as we possibly can right? yeah. little by little and just fighting the good fight of just doing right by by you doing right by the people yeah and and working collectively for a greater purpose right so we can well the, the bigger know. the bigger stuff takes too long to fix mm-hmm. that's why nobody wants to fix it because by the time it's fixed if you can you probably won't even be in office anymore right so like just just gaslighting people with trans rights or black right black rights or you know, illegals, whatever it is, is mm-hmm. easy. Yeah. Actually fixing the school system and lowering crime and lowering taxes, that takes years and years and nobody wants to do that. And if you don't have those taken care of, who cares about the other stuff? Right. You know, like our taxes are crazy here. Yeah. Your education system is horrible. Yep. The crime is through the roof. Why won't you take care of those things first? Those are mm-hmm. vital for a community to, to thrive. Cool. That's the core. Yeah. You know, like New Haven, First in crime, but you wanted to defund the police. How does that make any sense? Yeah. Um, they spend twenty-one thousand dollars per year per child of tax dollars, mm. but these kids are like two grades behind. Yeah. They're they're not efficient in math or English. It's cheaper just to, yo. Know, why don't you just give me give me six thousand dollars of that twenty-one? Let me send my kid to Catholic school yeah. or private school. You guys keep the difference and go fix your education system while my kid gets a real education. Yeah. Like, there's so many things you can do temporarily, but I don't think I even want, I feel like these people don't want to actually fix the problem. Yeah, they, they don't. You know? Yeah, it, and that's how it seems a lot. So, I'm, 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 um, that, that's why I said, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're, you're entering into the direction that, that you're heading to because, you know, uh, a little change is better than, than no change. And, and if we can slowly get the word out, you know, and people can see, you know, what you're really about. And that's what the interview is about, to, to get a little bit, you know, about who, who you are, where, where your mindset is at. And, and now as, as you're entering, like I said, into a new realm, you know, of fighting, now it's almost like uh, um, you're, you're not fighting for yourself, you know, in a ring. Yeah. You're fighting for, for a group of people, you know, for a community that, that you stand by. And, and um, I like that. I think it's excellent. And you, you have campaigns running right now, right, that, that you're going through. So we, 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 I definitely want to plug that into the video. Yeah. Um, any links? What, what You got to raise, what, about, you said 15 grand? Yep, but I'm, I'm about only three grand away. Oh, okay, beautiful. So I, we'll, we'll definitely put that in, in, in the link so we can, you know, push to, to get things forward. 
I'm glad that you're also covering the New Haven Hamden area because I, I'm not from Hamden, but we have a lot of friends and family that, that are in our local churches in Hamden. Okay. Um, uh, it, it, it'll be cool to, um, um, to get them aware also of, of, of what you're doing and, and get some set of eyes on you also so they can see that, you know, something is coming yeah. to the New Haven Hamden area. Um, and obviously they can do their own research and do their, their due diligence as to what, you know, what you're doing. But um, I'm, I'm totally, you know, 100% with you on your side, bro. I'm Absolutely. definitely 100% or whatever I can do on my side as well to, to just, you know, kind of partner with you and move it forward. Um, I'll do my best to, to do the same thing. But um, I do appreciate you, bro, uh, for having you here at this, at this Coffee Break episode, man. Uh, we just want to bring insight. We want to highlight people that, that, are, that are doing things that um, are affecting towns and communities, but that aren't really getting highlighted like they should be getting highlighted, you know. And that's the whole purpose for, for these Coffee Break episodes. So I thank you for, for coming in. Um, everybody that's watching, we're going to have all his information, his links, his social. Follow him everywhere, his Instagram, Facebook, what, whatever platform he's on. Go ahead, give him a follow. If you can support the, the campaign, I'll, I'll leave links to that as well. Um, and like every episode, thank you for tuning into another Coffee Break episode. Um, and we'll just see you in the next one, man. God bless you guys. Coffee break. Everything. We're all celebrating. We're all celebrating people.